Good to have you all back for another episode of ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture, broadcasting live. This is going to be our 208th episode, broadcasting live one last time for a while from three different locations in the world because all state worker troops are ordered to return to Hawaii, and that includes me. So I will be with you, DeSoto, soon. Uh, unfortunately, not really physically in studio yet because you just said restrictions are tightened again. But uh, we will both be in Honolulu and then we will still have you, Ron, in uh, your Long Beach, California. So good to have you guys back. Good morning. Hello. So um, I will start out with a um, online article of the New York Times from two days ago that a lady wrote, and she basically says, you know, the, there are still different scenarios for the climate depending on how we operate and how we act. But the main keys is that she said is how we heat, or we should say for us in the tropics, how we cool our buildings is one thing how we move on and how we uh, basically grow our food in the future. These are the key things besides obviously how do we harvest energy. So two of the points we're trying to combine and make relationships and this is architecture and automobiles. And last time we ended up on the ultimate of for us Germans what we call Straßenkreuzer and that is the Lincoln Continental and we talked about a sedan version, but even more the ultimate of the best ever and the most spectacular is, and if we get, get the first slide up for that one, is the convertible version. And to Soto Brivas, um, how that one is very strongly related to Hawaii. And also uh, we call you as the utmost uh, license plate expert to have some news that you saw today. Right. Well. This is one of the most famous cars in the United States. This is the early 60s Lincoln Continental. And it was, re it was redesigned from a very ornate and I think grotesque looking automobile into an incredibly clean, straightforward, beautiful car in 1960. And it became such an icon of American culture, not only because you, as you have pointed out in Germany, it's a street cruiser and it's an ultimate symbol of American culture, but it also is strongly associated with President Kennedy. And that is because in the last year of his presidency in 1963, he used this black Lincoln Continental convertible limousine as the car that he went around in motorcades in. And when he visited Honolulu in 19, June of 1963, the car was brought with him and he did a motorcade through Honolulu, which thousands of people attended and went to see him because he was, as you have said, uh, it was such a young, charismatic president for this time period of great optimism in the United States with the beginning of space travel and a real feeling of optimism for the future and how the future was so bright. Well, this car was the same car just months later that he was assassinated in when he was being driven in another motorcade through the city of Dallas, Texas. So the Lincoln has these two associations of the wonderful optimism and the clean lines of the car coupled with the connection to President Kennedy's tragic death. The license plates that were on that car, which were number GG300, were sold at auction in 2015 for $100,000. So anything associated with that moment in time obviously is monetarily really valuable. And you, uh, Martin, have associations with this same model of the Lincoln in Germany where you knew somebody who had one and you got to be driven around in it and he drove some other people around in it. Yeah, that one we see uh, here on number six, this gentleman, this is the architect Carson Roth. And while, you know, the, the American one has GG, this one here has HH, as we can see there. And this is the city of Hamburg. We did a show in the old Urban Transcendence show days 
and we said uh, um, uh, Germany's uh, Kaka Akel, uh, Hamburg's Harbor City. And so um, Carsten is an architect there and also a professor in the city of Braunschweig. And he, as he told me, you know, has long been a fan of America ever since he was a student. And this particular car here, he brought over when he was a student. And ever since he's taking it out for certain driving occasions, uh, like when, you know, he picked me up when I, I visited him. And so he was also the chair of the jury of the Lower Saxony States Award that then, uh, who is now the uh, president of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen, had to give the award to us for that very humble grocery store that we see on three that we did a show about. Another award we were lucky to get was um, down there at the, at the bottom associated to the gentleman on number eight, Hadi Teherani, who was an architect from the same town. He uh, got the award for metal roofs and facades for this building on uh, number nine, which is his own office and a couple other offices in the harbor area. And he started this little tradition of that. He started out as an architect, was one of his first projects, and he wanted this to be an emerging award. And so he gave it to us for the train station. And I continue that when I was the chair of the jury next time, this sort of unwritten rule of giving it to the little emerging guys versus to, to the big guys. So uh, Carson told me that one day he basically picked up Hadi and they cruised around in Hamburg with a top down. And he said they got so many looks and he thought, this is still a cool car to have until he realized, he said, they're not looking at the car. They're looking at my star architectural colleague, Hadi. And so, uh, you know, it has something to do with, I would say, status symbol, obviously also with you are what you drive, right? So there is, there is some ego there, but returning what you said to Soto at the very beginning, Karsten, when he has this car, he basically demonstrates his uh, basically homage to uh, mid-century America that everyone, including you know him as this generation and me, as I said before, was looking up to as we had our first, when you guys got us back on our feet as the, we had screwed up so badly before that, the first president chancellor we had was Konrad Adenauer. And nothing against age, Ron, we know you're the best example with, with, with age comes wisdom incredibly. Uh, but you're also still not just young and hard, but a really cool guy. And, you know, just like Joe Biden, you know, it's not a matter of age. It's a matter of mindset. But Konrad Adenauer wasn't really that guy that the young people could get excited about. So we had this very sort of grumpy old guy as a president. And you had this cool young guy that was a womanizer and was shooting people to the moon and microwaves and refrigerators and big, big boats, big cars. <laughs> And the picture at the bottom right is basically is still celebrated. One of the biggest events, if not the biggest event in my hometown in Hanover is this uh, American car show. And there is one, you know, of Kennedy's car there. So there's still, and we found out when you sent this morning, send us the license plate that sold in 2015 for $100,000. We frankly Googled where actually the car is and what it costs. And it's luckily and probably rightly so in the Fort Museum in, in, in Dearborn, Michigan, in your, near your home, uh, Ron. And so we don't know, and probably, you know, it's not for sale anymore. So sort of, you know, it has a nominal sort of, you know, um, value. But, um, but anyways, this is sort of, again, America as its best. And obviously for some architects, uh, really something to look up to. Um, ourselves, although you know we were so kindly peer reviewed here by these colleagues, uh, we were foreseeing the last world recession in 2008 and quality wasn't really what was selling well, talking selling. So we took this sort of dip and uh, at some point in 2005 gets us to the next page. Um, I couldn't see any new jobs on the, on the table. And when we see on the next slide, um, I was uh, then going back to uh, my alma mater in America, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, who said, hey, you've had some interesting years on the turf. Why don't you pass on some of that to the emerging generation and become a coach and teach with us, which I took their kind offer. And here you basically see I was, again, on a low budget, right? Not like the $600 of my Plymouth Fury before, but not much more. 
And Weird Wally wasn't an option. He didn't have cars of my like at that time. So I ended up with this colleague of mine whose name was Marv Feiken. And Marv is, is just like you, Ron, represents for me the best of America, this pioneering generation. There is a sort of honesty and humor at the same time. And um, so I, there's this one anecdote that I made you chuckle before when we talked that he, the way he does business is that he makes like puts everything into the car so they work. You see him there uh, in his white shirt with a tie and that's how he worked on these cars. And he basically then, uh, his cars were all in the range of $3,500, not thousand, but you know, $3,500. So he sold one to a guy who uh, basically bought it for his mother. The next day, the mother comes to the lot and is really angry and says, you know, this is the best car I ever had. You sold it to me for too cheap and gave him, wanted to give him uh, 500 extra dollars, which got Marv upset. And he said, that's not how I do business. So that again about the heartland and the honesty, just in contrast to the sort of the reputation we know from American movies with uh, car dealers them being the most dishonest sort of profession. And he had a Ford dealership. And then uh, when he retired, he basically had his own little business and bought all the cars back that he sold to the people. And um, uh, they bought it back to him, uh, sold it back to him. Um, the, the, the Lincoln uh, town cars were also made it uh, into movies, which, uh, Ron, you are recently or have been for a while really into movies. I think you uh, charge yourself with at least one a day. So the one on the top right, I, I intentionally offer you the German one. How is that called in English? Do you guys remember the movie? Oh, the Lincoln Lawyer. Exactly, with Matthew McConaughey, and obviously refers to his 80s Lincoln Town Car. But the movie I watched together with Marv and his wife around their, I think, 65th wedding anniversary was the, the movie at the bottom right with Clint Eastwood, both as director and main actor, Grant Torino. And occasionally his wife was kicking him and basically said, Marv, that's a little like you. And it was this sort of, you know, he admitted to like, you know, grow out of prejudices against other races uh, and, 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 and things like that. He, he could identify with that. So Marv was really a wonderful gentleman. And what he basically then uh, cut a deal with me is what I drove in his driveway here when I visited him on slide one. And that gets us to the next slide, uh, which shows us uh, my... Lincoln Town Car, my 93 town car. So when I was there as a student, I bought a 20 year old car. This was a little younger. It was 15 years or so or 16 old when I bought it at that time. And um, it's a Lincoln and Lincoln, what can I say? And the two pieces of architecture, uh, DeSoto, you can relate to it because we have pieces of the same architects in Honolulu, right? Yeah, you were pointing out that we have uh, the IMP East West Center and we've also got you also have a picture in here of the interior of the Ihilani Hotel. And I just wanted to say before we get further into that, that we've already mentioned before, at the same time that you were longing to buy an immense American car, oversized American car, I wouldn't even have thought about buying an oversized American car. I only bought small foreign cars. So as you commented earlier before the show, the metal is always shinier on the other side of the fence. Absolutely. And to add to the architecture, the Nebraska State Capitol is, is a Bertrand Goodhue building, and we have the Honolulu Museum of Art by Goodhue. And again, it's like, thanks, you mentioned already, Ron, your, your friend and business partner, Larry Stricker, designed the Hilani in the early 90s. And so it's a great piece of architecture in times that weren't that great anymore. That was the time when I went, you know, um, to, to school and um, they, these weren't the greatest times. We were kind of lost. And so to build, you know, good architecture in times that are challenging and not so good is even better. And Americans really, at, at that point, they, they, they wanted still to build what they were famous for the big boats. But uh, at that point of time, for various reasons, they weren't able to do this anymore, which gets us to the next slide, 
And I pass this on to you, DeSoto, because you commented before about that the different to architecture that's always static and and depending on in which climate zone you are, if you're in temperate climate zone, you get some extremes that we show off here. But if you're in a tropical one, you have only one. But cars are moving enclosures, right? So they can transition from one to the other one. And you want to walk us through where the town car started out and where it went? Well, you, you divided these pictures up into three columns. And the column on the left is pictures of the town car when it was in its original place of residence when you bought it in Nebraska, where it was sometimes literally buried in snow, where it was covered with sheets of ice and living in also, of course, warm, uh, warm temperatures during the summer. And you also pointed out that eventually you moved. And when you moved, you drove your Lincoln Town Car with a trailer attached to it. And you happened to be able to go through Colorado so you could see the famous Air Force Academy's uh, church or chapel, which was built during that same optimistic time period that we were talking about when President Kennedy was around and people were literally reaching for the stars. And then you moved to Arizona. And Arizona was a very much an opposite of the winter in Lincoln, Nebraska, because Arizona is incredibly hot in the desert. And you always try to park in the shade when you're outdoors with your car. But if you can't, even if you do, the car starts to deteriorate from the excessive heat. So you begin to lose the seals and the gaskets around things like your windshield or around the doors. The, the, the rubber will literally melt and deteriorate. And that's what happened, you said, also to your front uh, uh, turn indicator light, or not turn indicator light, but the cover for it just came off because it failed to hold it in place. And eventually yeah. the Lincoln came out here to Honolulu and it no longer had to deal with the extremes of, of terrible heat or the extremes of terrible cold, but it did eventually give up the ghost because it was just old. But as you pointed out, this was the last of that particular type of car. It's got a bench front seat. It doesn't have individual bucket seats. It's got this straight across flat dashboard. And it's something that we probably are never gonna go back to in terms of the styling of that type of American car. Yeah, and, and one more detail as far as, and, and Larry Medlin's son was kindly mm. fixing it up and you know, replacing the windshield seal gasket and also put the 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 headlights cover back on it so uh, thank you for that and we lost that when we we're going for a trip to the ninth island to vegas which you guys have to do by boat or by plane not by boat no no boat goes but but plane and i could drive there and it's just like reminded me of the space shuttle that we put there it's just when it got back into the atmosphere, it basically lost times of its heat shields. And so, so that one did, right? So America wasn't as good as it used to be where it basically built things to last and never break. My fury never, I mean, you know, besides that, that timing chain that then kindly fixed, you know, nothing ever broke. But here, especially the, and we, we get to the suspension next and we can get to the next slide of that one. Uh, the, uh, there is a saying, uh, nothing rides like a Lincoln, and that's certainly true, and that's because of air suspension, but these airbags get bad, especially in the extreme temperatures of the cold and the heat, and they get brittle, and then they basically, you get a low rider, and that's basically something that gets us to the next slide, but let us quickly, before we pass this on to you, Ron, uh, share that uh, we were able to go back to the movies and you're not just, Ron, watching, charge yourself to watch a movie at home, at least one per day, but you also are able to go back to the movies. So the one on picture one is the one you last saw in the cinema. So which one is that? Yeah, uh, the Fast and Furious franchise has probably been the greatest uh, positive force for American cars to be seen around the world in Hollywood history. And their, their ninth film came out, which, which they just called F9, because just to mention F, people know what it is. And if you want a good time at the movies and you'd like to see 
a classic Pontiac Fiero be connected to a rocket and be shot in outer space with uh, Vin Diesel watching the action, this is for you, F9. All right, we, we will go there. And as you see on the, on the advertisement poster, it's mostly contemporary cars, which you're probably promoting to buy the audience. But there's, I think that's Vin Diesel's too. There's, I think it's a, it's a Charger, a Dodge Charger, right? It's not a Challenger. I think it's a Charger. But someone we, uh, we used to, you know, enjoy as, as one of the characters in the, in the Fast and Fury ones uh, is not with us. And who is that? He's very familiar to us on the island. Well, that is our friend, so to speak. Um, 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 <laughs> I can't think of Dwayne name. Johnson, The Rock. Dwayne Johnson, thank you, because he's better known as The Rock. And he used to actually live here in Honolulu when he was growing up. And his father and uncle, I believe, lived here. He's mostly Samoan, a Samoan ancestry. And Vin has become a tremendously popular star. And he's a very likable guy on screen. But he's also kind of implied that he might get into politics. And Martin, you and I have been saying that if he wants to run for president, we like him and maybe we'll vote for him, but we'll see if that happens. But this is his latest movie, which is uh, based on the Jungle Cruise ride of Disneyland. It's kind of a fantasy of a Jungle Cruise uh, through Africa or perhaps on the Amazon in South America. Exactly. And that one we saw recently and something that is very American and we have it here. And I think you don't have any left in, in Honolulu. Am I right? And this is a drive-in right. movie theater. And I saw this with our um, exotic escapism expert, a youngest son, and we, we watched it. And we watched, um, well, that one actually, sorry, that one I saw, which uh, you see on uh, picture number eight, with my son Lenny and his uh, partner Rima, and uh, the uh, 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 Godzilla versus Kong, uh, I basically <laughs> saw with Jonathan. And that one, it's it's too hard to read and too small. But trust me, on number five, uh, at the end, where they feature all the people involved and all the places, it was half shot back on Oahu. So there we go. So we're here near Munich sitting in a, a drive-in that is all American. And all we watch are movies that are related in one way to another to back home uh, to Honolulu. And in which car did we uh, watch it? Since I'm not back yet, but Sunday we'll fly back and we will then take over again our PIing Mercedes um, from you to Soto because you hosted it kindly. So the one at the bottom left on number 10 is not ours, but one from originally in Germany. But on number eight, in which car did we watch it? Well, uh, uh, you did watch it in the Twingo, as I remember, and the Twingo is the little mini car, and I didn't realize the Twingo's roof opened up as much as it did, but it certainly is open looking in that picture, um, and obviously the weather in Germany at the moment, at that time, was nice enough for you to be able to sit under the stars, literally, and watch a movie. Exactly. But now we get back to America, to a phenomenon that we don't i think i we had that event or that showcasing once on that american car show in in my hometown but from here on ron it's all yours uh with that my lincoln became unintentionally a low rider because the the airbags went bad and so it was just like basically scratching the roads and i had no suspension left but there is another uh uh, uh, art in America that does this intentionally. And please introduce us to us with the slides nine and six and seven, Ron. You know, uh, having lived in the Los Angeles uh, area for uh, now 50 years, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that we, we know that for all of us, the freedom of the car is one thing, the fact that it's sexy, the fact that it can be a status symbol. But in my region, there is a culture that actually fetishizes cars. And by that, I mean that they venerate them with near religious intensity. And I'm talking about the lowrider culture, which is basically Hispanic members of car clubs that first organized in the, in the mid to late 1940s when uh, car culture was starting to take off across the United States. 
Now, these are extreme car lovers. There's no other word except lovers for them. They've tricked out their older American cars, as you see in the, in the boat and the bottom left uh, picture. And th they put in very bouncy hydraulics as an expression of what's mostly a Mexican-American cultural identity. And unlike the hot and fast hot rods, which is another Los Angeles phenomenon, these are meant to be low and slow because they drive slowly, they cruise the streets, and while they drive, all of a sudden, for those who aren't uh, expecting it, the cars begin to bounce up and down with their suspensions. Then they could drive on three wheels only, or if you really wanted to give someone a thrill who was on the sidewalk watching, you hit your hydraulics, the car leaps up on its, only on its back two wheels and drives down the street at a sort of stately 20 miles per hour. Uh, the car finishes had dozens of paint coats all rubbed to a dazzling hand rubbed gloss. Interiors are beautifully upholstered, mostly by sending them to Mexico where there are upholstery experts like you wouldn't believe. And then you'd open the hood and the entire engine blocks would be chromed to a shine. Just an amazing thing. If you go to slide four and zero in on that, the example of just how religious uh, the uh, our Chicano friends were about the cars is that there's a chest tattoo on uh, picture number four uh, that covers the entire chest. And instead of being Our Lady of Guadalupe or maybe a girlfriend, it turns out to be three of this person's favorite automobiles. And these cars are works of art. They, they have also exquisite paintings that, that have all kinds of aspects of Mexican-American life. And lowriders might not even make $25,000 a year, but they'll put that much in a year, God knows where they get the money, into their car. And they become legacies handed down to their kids. On the other hand, the most extravagant of these often very elegant lowrider cars are sometimes sold not as a legacy, but to special car collectors who have been known to pay a half million dollars for a good Mexican lowrider car from Los Angeles. Los Angeles has kicked off the car club culture, but Japan, Brazil, and Korea now have also followed. But in that case, speed is a definite component of their car club, car club culture. They take the smallest Korean and Japanese cars you can imagine, soup them up, and make them fly at speeds you would not believe. Uh, anyhow, cars as fetishes, as something to love, to venerate, to pass on to their kids. Uh, it, it's a Los Angeles phenomenon. Thank you, Ron. And with that, we're at the end of the show and we will start out the next one with uh, another lowrider version uh, of that you can actually also buy some, you know, not convert yours, but basically have um, them uh you know being customized by uh, a guy who's most famous for that so uh be excited for that so see us and we will also then cut the and cut the corner back to uh architecture and automobiles and the utmost challenge of our times is being environmentally uh responsible so all of that and more next week when i will be back if the airplane wants so so until then, please stay all uh, mentally mobile. Bye-bye.